Okay, the meeting is called back to order at 6.39 p.m. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, can I have a motion and a second that the agenda of February 13th, 2024 be approved as submitted? So, so moved. moved. Second. Oh. That's okay. okay. You can second it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Board members, questions or comments? No. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Can I have a motion and a second that the consent agenda be approved? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Okay, treasurer's report. May I please have a motion and a second that the treasurer's report, including the cash report, general fund cash report, the general fund revenue status report, the general fund budget status report, the school lunch fund cash report, and school lunch fund revenue and expense budget report for the month ending November 30th, 2023 be approved. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Okay, special reports. Thank you. We have two special reports this evening. Uh, first is uh, members of our high school team to talk about alternative education and the current tutoring center. So I'll invite them to come on up to the table. And then we'll hear later from Mr. Mike Gala, our director of transportation for a transportation update. And I will let you folks introduce yourself and then the clickers there and the slides are all set. Thank you so much for having us. Come on. Yeah, it uh, sounds like it's not on. There you go. How about now? No? Nope. Mm -hmm. My goal, oh, there we yeah, go. I didn't yeah. want them to have to come back out again. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for having us tonight. As you know, I'm Leanna Watt, building principal here at the high school. We'll do some quick introductions before we get into our presentation. I'm Alex Perry. I'm the special ed teacher who um, works the alternative program as well as operate the tutoring center. I'm Allie Hervé. I'm a school psychologist at the building. I uh, support the alternative education program after school. Charlie Roots, assistant principal at the high school. I also support the all ed program. So thank you again for allowing us to reschedule. I know we were supposed to be here a couple months ago and due to the weather, we weren't able to do that. So thank you for having us back. Um, a few years ago, to kind of frame this a little bit, um, when I started here, it was pretty apparent that we had some rather urgent needs to support our students. And after being here all of five seconds, um, I proposed some wild ideas, including the tutoring center to be able to better serve our students who had um, medical need or were out due to a suspension, um, housing that here. And shortly thereafter, also presented the idea of alternative education. And pretty blindly, there was some trust in allowing us to move forward with that endeavor, both from senior cabinet and from the board and, and supporting us that, uh, particularly um, with the support of COVID money and being really able to address some student needs in short order. And so tonight is really just an opportunity not only to thank you for um, all of that support, but to also highlight the successes that we've had during that time. I know some of you have had the opportunity to visit in person and see that firsthand, but um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the folks who are here because they took those wild ideas and said, okay, like we're, we're game, we're on board, we're gonna figure this out with you. And they took it and ran with it and made it exactly um, the successful programs that, that they are right now. So with that, we're gonna start in telling you a little bit about the tutoring center that's here um, on the second floor of Penfield High School. All right, let's see how this works. Okay, so the tutoring center, this is what our space looks like. Um, many of you have been up there. It's not always that cold. We have heat now, so the hoodies are no longer there. Um, who it is, it's me and my TA Kim. So I'm a certified special ed math teacher um, and Kim and I coordinate everything. So we get the work, the kids, the parents, the teachers, administrators, we communicate with all of them to make sure that kids have everything they need when they're out of school. 
So our goal is basically to service those kids who have been out of school for extended periods of time, um, as Mrs. Watt mentioned. These are the students that we've supported. So last year we had 149 referrals. That's a mix of Bay Trail and high school. Um, this year, that number's a month old, so it's a little over 70 now um, so far this year. And again, both Bay Trail and PHS kids. And this is just part of the MTSS process. So all of our kids go through MTSS. Um, this is a Tier 3 support. So they've gone through several things before they get to me. Short and sweet, thanks. All right, so we're going to transition to the alternative education piece of the presentation. Um, we're going to take this moment to rebrand ourselves and call ourselves the Penfield RISE program, which stands for Reimagining Instruction for Student Engagement. Can you please be my clicker? Thank you. So here we are. You guys have already seen who we are. So we work as a team. So Charlie, Alex, and I meet every week to discuss student needs. We meet every other week with Leanna to discuss kind of overarching needs of the program. We each have different roles within the program. Charlie's a, um, sh the assistant principal on the team, so the administrator. So he handles all the attendance. He handles curriculum planning with the teachers, making sure the grading is you know, where we want it to be, making sure the assignments are out in time. Um, any disciplinary referrals also go through Charlie. He also calls calls all of the parents and the students when they're not here, checking in on attendance, seeing what we can do to help them get back to school. Uh, a lot of our kids struggle with attendance. That's why we have this alternative program. It's really for those kids that are very disengaged. Alex, um, being a certified special education teacher, he supports our IEP students and our 504 students within the program. So that could mean consulting with teachers as needed, or it could mean pushing into a classroom to actually support. He's also the first person that everybody sees when they join the program in the afternoon. We're right back there in the library classroom, and he is warmly welcoming our students in with snacks. I fill the snacks. He brings the snacks. He gets all the credit. <laughs> um, and then he plays games. There's often a lot of games going on back there, too. There's games that are, there's like trivia and all sorts of things that he's doing with kids that are really goofy. It's a really nice, warm environment for kids to come to. Um, you know that I'm the psychologist on the team, so I do the social and emotional support. So if a student is having a crisis in those afternoon hours, the teacher can call or text me, and I can come down and assist them with that. I also do any restorative conversations that might need to happen between students or between staff and students or between staff. It's definitely we're building it as we're flying, so there are moments where we're in need of some restorative conversations. I also plan and coordinate all the community building within that. So sometimes that looks like a formalized circle where we sit down and talk about goals or we talk about achievements or things we want to accomplish. Other times, like this week, it's going to be a party. We're going to have pizza. We're going to play board games. We're going to get the kids all in the center kind of engaging with each other. The counselors are often invited. The teachers are invited to come down. Administrators are invited too. It's usually a good time. So the need for alternative education has existed way before COVID even happened. We know this to be true. COVID really exacerbated the need. And like Leanna said, it was pretty blatantly obvious that we needed something different for a lot of our kids. So really what we want to do is get kids to come back into the building if they can, re-engage them in some way. Not every kid is going to engage in that traditional approach to education. A lot of them need something different, something non-traditional. So we are able to kind of bring those kids in on a modified schedule, so truncate their day so they can start later in the day, which is really appealing to a lot of our students. And then they stay for that hour and a half extra after school. It will hopefully reduce you know, absenteeism is what we're shooting for here. It should lower our GED referrals, which we all know have skyrocketed in the last few years, um, as well as our dropout rates. Those have also increased, unfortunately. So we're hoping to avoid some of that by catching these kids early and kind of getting them into a program that's different than what they've had before. So again, we talked about improving school attendance, but a lot of this is about connection and community. So the reason kids come to school, these particular students, is not because they love school. They don't really love academics, right? They are looking for that social emotional connection and that could be with one of us as an adult in the program or one of their teachers, or it could be with other peers that are here. They're not coming because they don't value education anymore. They don't see a need for it. So we're really working hard on those social emotional interventions to bring them back in so that they can find some value in being here and hopefully start accruing those credits towards a high school diploma. We all know the statistics right, for GED versus dropout for high school diploma, and we know how devastating that can be for future success. So we're really hoping to continue to build this program so that kids can keep accruing credits so that they can earn their high school degree. Thank you. So the, the process that uh, students go through to be referred to um, Alt Ed is through our MTSS process. 
It's through our um, MTSS support team. So these are students who have experienced um, either homework help, we've already truncated their schedule, uh, we've had parent meetings in advance of this, frequent parent meetings, we've even done home visits, um, and a variety of other interventions that we've put in place and can run concurrent with Alt-Ed. Um, that's pretty much how uh, students can enter this program. Currently, uh, staffing-wise, we have two classes and two preps per week. The classes will meet uh, Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday after school from 2.45 to 3.45. The 2.20 time to 2.45 is our community building time um, when kids um, are getting their snacks, meeting with adults. Um, during that time, uh, we, we also do some different activities as Ellie's described. Currently, we have uh, two math teachers, three history teachers, three English teachers, uh, one PE teacher, and the three of us assist with coordination. The courses we currently offer for this school year are algebra. We offer um, English uh, 9 through 12. Currently, it's 10 through 12. Uh, geometry, we offer government and economics, phys ed, global two, and U.S. history. Thanks. So Charlie already touched upon this a little bit in terms of our structure. It's a very abbreviated structure for our academics. Like he said, it's going to be Monday through Thursday if you're taking two classes, right? So you can take up to two. Um, and then we meet back there, like I said earlier, in the library classroom for snacks and games and support. And then around 2.45, the teachers come down and they scoop up their kids and they bring them back to their classrooms for instruction. Um, this allows students, like I said, to have that shortened schedule throughout the day. Some of our students can only access alternative education at this time because they're so socially overwhelmed or they've just lost the stamina for education because of COVID. So it's really been a safe place for kids to come to be able to continue to accrue some of those credits. I guess I'll take over the clicker. All right. <laughs> so last year when we started, it was January. So like right smack in the middle of the year. So we just kind of were winging it, right? It went really, really well, and we're very happy to report that two of our seniors that were not going to graduate did graduate, and this is a picture of one of them right there. It was very exciting for him, and this was a kid that did not have a truncated schedule. I'm talking 7.30 to 4 o'clock he was here. So that is a commitment, right? So he really wanted it, but if we didn't have this program, he wouldn't have graduated on time, and the likelihood of him taking summer courses was pretty slim to none. So we have 22 students right now. So this means that students are here accruing credits towards graduation. And if we didn't have the program, they would be not on track for graduation. So likelihood of dropping out. It's also students who we've been able to avoid putting in um, alternative placements outside of Penfield. So sometimes we have kids that go through special education to go into a social or emotional program or a behavioral program. We've been able to keep those kids in house by providing that small sort of like inclusive supportive environment. Um, we are also offering and offered last summer the summer school program. That was actually Alex and Charlie who were running that program over the summer. 30 of our students participated in that last year, so we opened it up to some more students as well. This gave kids the opportunity to earn four credits, right? So if they're behind, they're catching up. They can take two at regional and they could take two at alternative education for new credit. And that really kept kids like on track in terms of graduation. It can also expedite them a little bit if they wanted to try to get ahead because school is just not their jam. So um, some of our next steps, of course, are to hopefully, um, with your support, continue to invest in this program for students and make this part of our regular programming for our students and for our families. Long term, we as we grow and develop and we are constantly reflecting and reviewing on some of the small and big changes, we see a need for time to write curriculum and to really process. This is very new and different for teachers in terms of the approach they're taking. It's a shortened period of time that they're with students and so really focusing on what are the must-haves, right? How do we accomplish the same curriculum, prepare students for Regents exams with a little bit less time to do so? So there are some needs and some things that we want to continue to tackle to continue to make it amazing. It's pretty great right now, but we know that there's room for us to grow and more support that we will need along the way potentially, depending on how we want to you know, continue to tackle student needs in that way. So we are happy to answer any of your questions, and by we I mean them, because I also have to go and open the um, concert that's happening in five minutes down in the auditorium. So um, thank you so much for your time, and I'm very sure they'll be able to answer all of your questions. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Do you guys have any questions for us? Board members, questions? Not a question, but a comment. Um, so as a as an individual who had to utilize an alternative program um, and going to, it, my situation was a little different, so going to school in a day but then leaving the, the school district to go to a different school to take classes at night to just finish high school early. Um, it's just really, it's impressive to see that this is uh, something that's being addressed in this Penfield School District and it's, and it's needed. I think if COVID taught us anything is that the way we were looking at the road to get an education prior to COVID, it, it doesn't necessarily, that way doesn't necessarily serve our children t today. So I'm glad that this is something that's being addressed in the district. Thank you. We felt the same way that it was almost like the student population that was saying this is not okay anymore. Not for all of them, but for a handful of them. Mm -hmm. Like I don't learn this way anymore and I'm demanding something different. So it kind of lights a little bit of fire under us to be like, okay, you're not coming to school. So how can we support you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, you help um, explain how do you manage the students exiting the program? Is this, is there, are they in this program till graduation or do they exit part, you know, with, you know, from year to year? And then how do you measure, aside from graduation, how do you measure their, their success as once they've exited? That's a really good question. Right now our program is pretty flexible, so it can be used as a full-on alternative program for kids who are taking those two classes. Some of it's a little bit credit recovery too, so they have failed and they're taking it again to try to test out. And that actually is something we weren't able to put in our slide this because we'd already sent in the presentation, mm -hmm. but I think we had seven students test out halfway through the program. One student in particular tested out of four classes, which was ridiculous. So that also shows you how bright our students are when given the correct approach to education. So students are allowed to take credits that they've failed and retake them and then test out midway through the year, which also opens up the spring semester for them to take additional credits to move forward. Some of our students, this doesn't work for. It doesn't work for. Um, it's an abbreviated program right now and some students need more than that. Um, and we've had to exit, I think only one, two, three, maybe about three students we've asked to leave the program. Um, and this was primarily because they were not attending anything at that point, despite all of the interventions that we, we tried. Does not mean we're not still trying to service that kid in another way or those children in another way. We are constantly trying to do that, but um, they didn't, this program wasn't, wasn't for them. We've also had to exit kids for um, substance abuse issues that they were bringing into the program, trying to hook them up with our substance abuse counselor and trying to work on other avenues of getting those kids support. Um, and then yes, for example, we will make recommendations pretty soon here for next year. So we are going to make a list of the students that were like, I think this is really working for them. How about we think about this for summer school? How about we think about this starting in the fall? Last year, we weren't able to really do that. So there were a couple of kids that kind of fell through the cracks. And I was like, oh, shoot, we should have, that kid should have been in it from the get-go. Instead, they failed the first half of the year and are now in it later. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're ironing things out as we go. But um, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best to kind of keep track of that data and sort of support the kids along the way. Did that answer your question? It does. And I just want to say, you know, I, I think this is a great example of how our goal is not just present information and you know they they succeed or they don't you know we do you you got uh, we you <coughs> are you know coming up with programs to help do everything possible to make sure that your child succeeds in getting through school and I think that's that's you know what we really uh, believe in thanks that's what we believe in too and we've really had to think outside the box <laughs> for some of these things and uh, my colleagues will tell you that I'm very impatient that I want everything right now because I'm just so desperate to like help the kids that I see that are struggling and I'm so inspired by um, you know other programs that are running. I mean, I think Charlie would buy the community center tomorrow if he could, but <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're very thankful for your support so far and we hope we can continue to help serve our kids. Any other questions? Any other? Uh, Any question. um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your passion, for your diligence, and for your, um, your effectiveness. You know, like, I really appreciate it. And our students who have benefited from your, your work, they are very, very lucky. Thank you so much. So can you just ex explain to me, um, so these kiddos, they come to school later, 
and they stay later. Is that it? You know, so they still participate in regular classes or how does this work? Because they only stay for an hour after school. It's really dependent upon each student. Um, so okay. we do have some students that have truncated schedules where they do have late arrival. Um, mm -hmm. We do offer transportation to them. There are other students um, that could be seniors who have a full schedule who are also doubling up on courses. Especially in the summertime, we had a number of kids that um, were able to recover credit with the courses. So it's really student to student dependent, but the majority of the students that are in the program right now are students who do come uh, late to school at, okay. at this time. All right. And what are you, besides our support, you know, like 100%, what are you, what are your needs? What are the resources? Like if you, if I could tell you, you could have anything right now to continue this. This is a really dangerous. So, <laughs> was, so Listen, I, I know a guy. I know a guy. Dan, Dan off, Riffle. Off he's of a money our guy. public board meeting, let's meet with Tom and talk about <laughs> Right, right, right. All right. So I'm just like a wish list. You know, I'm not saying you're, you're going to get it. I'm not <laughs> saying you're going to get it. Yeah. Just like I want to know. I mean, honestly, like my personal vision would be to have a full program. That's not something that's on the table right now, and I understand that. But if we're talking about short-term need, we really do. I really think we need more mental health support. I would love to be able to get into the homes of students, really do some behavioral interventions with their families to try to figure out the function of why they aren't coming to school. And that's something I don't currently have a lot of time for in my schedule as a full-time psychologist. Okay. I'd love to be able to meet with kids and set goals and track goals and, and do all that sort of thing. Um, so more additional support to support the behavioral aspect and the me emotional mental health aspect would be helpful. I think too, um, and I can't speak for, for Dr. Rudes, but I think that when you're pulled in different directions, when you're doing two jobs at the same time, that, that can be difficult too. Um, I don't know what you can do about that, but I mean, you know, there's only so many of us and there's only so many hours in the day. So, <laughs> so what I'm hearing you say is that um, this is proof that when we support our students with social, emotional learning and health, that they do better academically. Absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely, and that's what the research shows. Thank if you, you hold kids to high academic standards and you hold them to high emotional standards, they do better all around. Okay. You cannot have one without the other. Yeah. Thank you. I don't have a question, just a comment. I just wanna applaud you for all of your hard work. I know when we say all, we mean all, and you're obviously um, wrapping your arms around all those kids, some of our neediest kids and you're creating relationships and you're making them a priority and you're creating an environment where they feel safe and welcomed and like they belong. So just thank you for doing that for some of our kiddos that really need it the most. Thank you. That's great. Yes, I have nothing to say about that at all. But thank yeah. you just for your flexibility, I would say, you know, in starting the program and, and meeting those needs that were there. I benefited. I had a student last year who, um, I don't even know what to say. She just was marching to the, her own, the beat of her own drum, so to speak. And so it was really beneficial for her and she made it through and she's doing really well. So thank you for that. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So that was special report one. Mike Gal, I hope you're ready because they, they set the bar pretty high. <laughs> You've got pictures in your slides, though, so that helps. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi, Mr. Gallagher. Yep. Okay. Um, I'd like to just give you a little update on uh, what we're doing right now, where we stand, and hopefully, um, unlike some of the past meetings um, that I've been to, it's a little more positive. Uh, I have some, some positive uh, things happening out here that uh, I'm, I'm excited about. So anyway, I'll introduce our staff again because it's brand new. Our, our office staff <coughs> consists of our new dispatcher, um, our router, our office clerk, and we have a trip coordinator. Each one of these people started in September um, along with the new software program um, for routing. So it was a big challenge for those folks to walk in. My dispatcher is Melissa Glavis. The router is John Hogan. The office clerk is uh, Tracy Lash. 
and our trip coordinator is a driver who came in to help us out in the middle of the day for a couple hours with trips, um, and that is um, Jenna Downs. And of course, Bob uh, Singer's been with me my whole time as safety coordinator. So um, those guys did a, a great job coming in with a situation where we weren't quite sure what was going to happen, but it worked out. Um, we have currently 67 DMV roster drivers. I think that's up by four from last year. And ideally we would like 75 of them, but we're on our way there, and you'll see in a couple of slides down. I have 17 attendants currently, two of which are trainers for drivers. They're going to be drivers. <coughs> we had five mechanics, uh, one retired, and now we have the four one of which is our stock room inventory keeper and mechanic. And um, I just hired a, par a driver and a part-time mechanic. And I think we're gonna fill that last fifth position with this gentleman. He seems to be doing quite well. Uh, he's already working out there and um, he has a license. He just doesn't have the PNS endorsement, which is passenger and school bus, which he's gonna be going for here very shortly. I have uh, five drivers in training. One went for, and so unfortunately I did this slide prior to this happening, so um, he went in uh, February 8th, last Thursday. Passed the road test, so we're just waiting for his license to process through the system. We'll have a driver um, early next week, even though we're closed, but it'll be ready to go. Um, and I'm gonna have two more drivers taking road tests before the end of February. So that's Great. three new drivers, that's, that's plus. Um, we've had our share of challenges this year, but it's definitely getting better. We've managed to keep up with the loss of a few drivers and anticipate two to three more retirees this year at the end of the year. So we're not, we're not out of the woods, but we're getting there. <clears throat> our current operation as far as buses, we have 63 large buses, 14 minis. <coughs> we have three wheelchair buses. Uh, in another slide, I'm going to talk more about what's coming down the pike here. Uh, currently, we have 238 runs or um, routes in the district, within the district, and 32 outside of district. And we're serving approximately, not approximately, we're serving 50 schools. We unfortunately had to go with contract uh, transportation for a few people this year. Um, and right now I have five runs going to four different schools with them. They were 10, I just brought five back into us. We're, we're handling it again. And hopefully uh, sometime by the end of the year we'll be able to handle all of it again and start fresh again like we did last year without any help. And, and Mr. Gall, I just wanna, for my own, I'm gonna stop you, I apologize. The, sure. When we talk about the contracted routes, that means that, that it's not our drivers running those runs, but we contract with a transportation company to take care of that because we don't have the staff to do that, it. That is correct. Is that fair? Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. Which is actually, some in some years, it's many more than that. You've really brought oh, yeah. that down. Yeah, we've cut it down. Well, last year we didn't have any. Yeah. Um, this year I just, there wasn't enough. And when I show you where we go, you'll you'll understand a little better. Thank you. And BOCES right now is doing 10 of the schools for us, uh, serving 45 students. <clears throat> Driver training. We've added this is from last January to this January. We've added nine new drivers and six new attendants. So we're, we're getting drivers in, we're training them as, along with the attendants. Unfortunately, we've lost six um, between retirements and just uh, leaving. So we're still ahead three, that's plus. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we're doing. Um, <coughs> two drivers started, uh, uh, their starting dates are to be determined, but we're expecting uh, two of them in April I have one more going in March, and we'll have, and I'm sorry I had those reversed, but we're gonna have three trainees left in April that we expect to have trained and up and running as drivers May, early June. So we have quite a bit going on as far as drivers coming in. All right, now, there's some questions around this, so I, I hope I can do this without confusing everybody. <laughs> the entry-level driving training, which is managed by the Federal Trade, <coughs> I'm sorry, the Federal Motor Carry Safety Administration, has a minimal requirement to obtain a CDL license, whether it's A, B, C, whatever it is. Okay, there's been a moderate change to the under-the-hood knowledge that a new driver needs with their curriculum, okay? 
Basically what they did is they've removed everything under the hood with the exception of fluids, your oils, your antifreeze, um, not transmission fluid, but um, power steering fluid, anything like that. They still have you learning that and they also have you going under the hood to check steering linkages, um, U-bolts and all the things that go under into the steering system. Um, everything else they've taken right out of it. So that's, that's really huge because you're not looking at all kinds of crazy stuff, turbos and everything else that was necessary. New York State has created, <laughs> Governor Hochul, uh, an S1 license has been implemented for school bus licensing, which eliminates the need to go under the hood completely. This is a different classification of licensing. It's, it's called an S1. The class license only allows for New York State school bus drivers to drive school bus, whereas the CDLB allows you to drive school bus, coach bus, uh, dump truck, straight box trucks. There's multiple different vehicles you can drive. Um, it also <laughs> limits, the S1 limits the driver to being able to drive only intrastate, so they can't go outside. Not a big deal for us, but somebody down in Mount Morris or Bath where they're going to go to over the line to Pennsylvania, that becomes a big issue for them. It is my belief in the way we're operating at this moment that this is not really a hindrance or the, the other way is not a hindrance to us. I prefer to train our drivers to be a class B driver showing them how to do the oil and the steering is minimal compared to what we used to have to show them and I see no sense in not showing them and getting them a full class B license. The other reason for that is there's that very last line that New York State DMV offers this as a waiver license at this time. What does that mean two years down the road? I right. don't know but I don't want to end up without drivers. <laughs> so we're going with the Fed's uh, version of it. We're going to go with a regular CDL license and we're going to stay there. All right. <clears throat> DOT, Department of Transportation, our buses are inspected every six months. Over this is over the course of the last year. Uh, our current uh, rating is a 98.67. I like it to be 100, but I'll take the 98.67. It's out of 150 inspections over the past years. We've had no. Um, a defects, we've had a couple B defects, the difference being an A defect is a massive problem, a brake problem or, or a, a bad tire or tie rod or something like that, whereas a B problem is the cluster lights around the top of the bus, maybe one was out or maybe there was a seat torn in the bus that we didn't catch or even cleanliness of the bus can, can get us a B rating. We did actually have two B ratings through that and that's why we're at 98.67. Um, I'll take that. I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dust, bus durability. <clears throat> We're, we talked about this last year, and, and some of these frames are a little bit from last year, and I'll, I'll explain as we go. Um, I just want to show you where we've gone since last year with it. We, we're, tending, we're trying to hold on to the buses longer. We know that the diesel, the, the diesel engines will last. The body and the frames are what's failing. We live in the salt-ridden country. Uh, you know, I don't know where else they have as much salt as we do here, but <laughs> the, those buses are tore apart pretty quick. Within four or five years, we're seeing significant rust underneath of them. We've, added, um, we've implemented a, an, an additive to the fuel to help the fuel injectors because the fuel injectors are the next most costly part on this bus that after we get upwards of 70, 80,000 miles, stopping and going with diesel or even your car if you drove it that way all the time you're going to coat everything up especially with diesel fuel so this additive is helping us to uh, break this fuel down keep those injectors lubricated and keep them um, clean <coughs> hopefully preventing us from having to replace them at 75 eighty thousand miles at a cost of if we do it five thousand dollars so again, that's something we added into the fuel. It cost us about $1,800 a, a season, a, a school year, f for the additive to be added to the f to diesel fuel. Um, we're, we're very optimistic this is going to be a helpful tool. A couple of old photos I'm going to show you are, uh, you saw them last year, and I'm going to just tell you real quickly, that's a 
that's a five-year-old bus now, okay, that won't um, fail DOT, but it really is pretty ugly looking under there. Um, and there's another picture of it. Once, once that, that rail, which I don't have a pointer, but that bottom rail with the holes that you can see and it goes, then, th then that has to be replaced. These are the oldest buses in the fleet that we have, um, and they're going away next year. So we're not going to do much with them unless the OT says to us we have to react to it, um, but we're not going to do it. What we did implement last year was this, and this is that sprayed on undercoating that we talked about. Each one of the new buses and all the way back to our 330 version buses, and we're up to 387 right now, um, is sprayed with this. And this is the same bus you looked at last year after a winter. So what they do is they'll spray it all down after, after the season and they come in in June or July once school's done and they respray them every year. They guarantee us 10 years with no rust. Mm -hmm. And so here's just an example. Granted, it's only two years old, but um, there's an example of what it looks like right now. So we're thinking we're gonna be able to hold these buses together a lot longer. All right, bus durability. Our intent, obviously, again, is to use the buses for more years and get more miles out of them. We've increased our mileage this year by 23,000 miles, 23,400 miles more. That's more traveling that we're doing than we did last year. Currently, we're at 300, as of February 1st, we're at 396,856 miles on our buses. Um, last year, we were at 410 and some change by the end of June. So you can see we're well ahead of where we were gonna be. Um, we have a few more drivers, we have more students, and we have more mileage to cover, which is creating this. Um, so all the more reason that we wanna make these buses last longer and get more miles out of them. Uh, I, I mentioned in an earlier slide, we took five of the students back from contract. Uh, it's Angel Heart medical transportation company is who's transporting those students for us. They're capable of handling wheelchair if we need them. Um, they're very, um, very easygoing, small company, very dedicated to the students, and I'm, I'm very pleased with them. Um, in the next couple of uh, videos, I'm gonna, or videos, the next couple of uh, slides, I'm gonna show you where we go. You saw some of this last year. It's changed a little bit, nothing drastic. Um, but this is what we do outside of Penfield. <coughs> so this is a hard slide to see, but if you see the darker green in there, that's our district, that's Penfield itself, right? It goes from um, Ellison Park over to the left, my left, and over to just before Walworth. And then it's five miles north and south, and our new garage is up at the top. So that's, that's our current in-district um, routes. In the sides, which we can't see, <coughs> sorry, the uh, print is a little small, are some of the names of the places that we go out of district. It's not all of them, but for some examples, Rochester School for the Death, Bay Knoll, um, Spencerport, Admin Building, Rochester Tech Park, which is out in Gates, Hope Hall, Norman <laughs> Howard, just to name a few. Um, Lehigh Station Road has got a BOCES program out there that we go to. So that just, this gives you a rough idea of some of the names of the places. This next one. Mike, on that slide, the number after the school, is that number of miles, number of Miles teams? from, from the I, garage. That's one way. miles from the garage, one yeah. way. All right, thank you. All right. Um, <coughs> this is one of my favorite slides. All those little green dots are our buses. This is GPS telling <coughs> us where the buses are at any given time. So as we get close to 9 o'clock in the morning, all the buses are converging together and it gets to be one big green blob. And then when they get to 441, Five Mile Line Road, Atlantic Avenue, Whalen Road, you start to see these lines and they're all coming back into the thing. So it's, it's very nice for us to know where the bus is and we can pinpoint a bus right down to where it stopped. So it's, uh, it's a very accurate thing. The circles on here is what I'm... Um, pointing out as to our outlying destinations. We go as far out east as Williamson. Um, to the south, we're going to Farmington. To the west in the top corner, that's Spencerport. And the bottom corner, 
south, and it doesn't really look as far, but it's a little bit further, is Scottsville. So we, we travel all of that, and that's how those miles are made up. This is just another picture of it um, in a different way. The students living outside of the district, there are students but have been um, displaced for some reason for a period of time, are the yellow dots. This um, you can see out east there's one and then there's condensed right there in Rochester and Greece and then down south a little bit. That is down considerably from last year. So massive um, improvement in, in, in what we had to do last year with that. The terribly blue line that I circled over there, that's Penfield again, and you can again see all the red marks where, where we go. Uh, 18 students out of district, 10 different schools. We used 14 drivers and 14 buses to do it. We're down this year, last year we were 448 miles, I believe, and now we're down to 444 miles per day doing that. <coughs> Unfortunately, we've contracted and they are covering 171 miles for us, so that's actually 915 miles if we were doing it all. But we're doing it, and we're doing it pretty, pretty smoothly. <clears throat> all right, now, the wish list. <laughs> May's bus purchases, or we, we have nine buses that we're hoping to replace. They consist of one minibus to replace a bus we already had, bus 356, which was totaled in an accident on 441 last year. Um, I should tell you right now, minibuses are next to impossible to get. Um, they're taking over a year from the date of the order to the time they're actually going to give them to us, and there's no guarantee. I am still waiting for last year's buses. So I'm asking. Um, we're, we're trying to get 356 replaced because we always had that, but we've never been able to replace it. We have two additional minibuses on order because we're concerned about the long lead time to it. And we have a need for an additional wheelchair bus. Currently, we have three. All three of those wheelchair buses are used in different parts of the town um, and district or uh, outskirts. And if one breaks down, we're in big trouble. All right, so now somebody's late for school or we've got a problem. Or even more simple, if we need to do a DOT on it or we need to do a, a service on it and it's not available to transport, we're in, we're in trouble. So we ordered, or would like to order one more. And we have five large diesels um, that we're expecting, hopefully, get approved, that we'll be able to get rid of those rusty ones you saw <coughs> in the earlier slides. So with all that said, um, basically, I think we're starting to see a, a light at the end of the tunnel. We have people coming in. We, I hired somebody today. <laughs> we brought someone new in. Um, so actually, that's wrong. We have six people going to be training here shortly. Um, and we're hoping to put together in, in early, early May, late April, maybe some kind of open house to intrigue some more people to come in. And uh, we haven't really deep detailed this yet but just put some buses out there bring some people in let them get on the bus talk to them have them meet some other drivers have some food everybody likes food for some reason especially me um and uh, just try to try to get some people to see how rewarding the job actually can be that's all i got board members questions comments uh, the federal ent entry-level driver training where they um, made the change under the hood, mm -hmm. is that permanent or is that a, a waiver for a period of time? So the New York State portion is a waiver. The federal end of it, no, that's permanent. That's okay, that was a permanent mean. change? Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't explain it and I don't understand it <laughs> because why you would do that, I'm not exactly sure. But <laughs> it, it helps because now we only have to go check the oil, the antifreeze, and windshield wash and, and power steering fluid. We don't have to check transmission fluid. We as drivers of Penfield Central Schools and our school buses, we don't check any of that once you get your license because we have the mechanics check that on right. a 30-day basis, right? Unless we see a puddle of oil and we suspect there's a problem, we're not going to really do any of that. Um, that's why I think that it's best that we continue going with the Class B license. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Okay. So much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Thank Gal. You.
Okay, student rep. Hello. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, um, Hello. For district updates, um, as we saw earlier with Mrs. Watt, there actually is a string extravaganza that is being hosted in the auditorium right now. Um, students from all through the district are playing <coughs> amazing pieces such as like collections of symphonic favorites. Uh, I loved hearing that one personally. Um, and uh, sticking with the music theme, over 80 students throughout the district were selected to represent Penfield at upcoming all-county festivals. So that could be anything from strings, band, vocal, jazz. We have everything. Um, the, and at PHS, um, the BSU is facilitating a spirit week for Black History Month. Uh, everybody is encouraged to participate. Uh, today's theme was Culture Day, where students were encouraged to rep their own culture. I'm wearing blue and, right, blue and white for Greece. Um, and tomorrow is Sneaker Day, where students should wear their freshest kicks. Um, Girl Up raised $3,600 through their Walk for Water campaign to build a rainwater collection tank for a school in Uganda. Um, the tank has been completed and is now providing water to an entire Ugandan community, which is awesome. Uh, the Best Buddies Club made friendship bracelets for Valentine's Day. Um, and the PRISM concert showcased the most talented musical groups in the school. The boys relay team recently placed first in a county championship. And on Thursday, students, wear sh students wore shorts to honor Matt Traybold and spread awareness about suicide prevention and mental health. And Book Club is going on a field trip to see Oedipus Rex at the Temple Theater downtown this Thursday. At Bay Trail, students are having lots of fun with a pre-break spirit week, and Project Enrichment is hosting a book brunch to discuss fantasy worlds and literature. The indoor track team had an exemplary performance at the last meet of the season, and a team of four Bay Trail students placed second in the chapter competition of math counts to secure their place for the state competition, which will be held in March in Saratoga. And Clay Club will be starting on Monday the 26th. At Indian Landing, uh, videos of teachers reading books related to Black History Month are being uploaded for families to view at home. Uh, abridged biographies include Michael Jordan, Stevie Wonder, and Mae Jemison. And at Harris Hill, the PTA sold candy grams that will be soon delivered to teachers and classrooms for Valentine's Day. And on Tuesday the 27th, families are invited to a reading night full of games, adventures, and book swaps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So we have uh, superintendent reports. I just have a couple of student staff honors. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any uh, Penfield Central School District update, so you'll see a blank slide there. I mm -hmm. thought I'd prepare for you for that. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffle to talk about some business updates as we head into the wonderful world of budget. So Art Award, um, congratulations to PHS senior Ava Sodden on winning the School for American Crafts Ceramics Award for her Raku sculpture. Um, her work was displayed in the recent high school, middle school exhibit at RIT's gallery. We talked about that, I think, uh, two meetings <laughs> ago. So congratulations. Uh, incredible talent there. A lot of hard work, I'm sure. Uh, Do the Right Thing Award. Congratulations to PS, PHS senior Ange Angelina Lapina on being named the recipient of the Do the Right Thing Award by the Rochester City Police Department. Students are honored for displaying leadership, role model behavior, and volunteering in their community. And the Math Counts team, Bay Trail Math Counts, came in second during the local chapter. And they're looking very mathematical there in that picture. <laughs> and this is uh, School Counseling Week was February uh, 5th to 9th. School counselors were honored during that National School Counseling Week for the tremendous impact they have in helping students achieve social, emotional well-being and academic success. So um, we didn't have a meeting last week, which is why we're talking about it this week, but uh, kudos to all of our school counselors and the work that they do uh, with our students and our families. 
The congratulations to 87 Penfield students who have been selected to participate in the MCSMA All-County Music Festival in March. Maybe some of them are down at the Strings Extravaganza happening right now in our auditorium. Congratulations to those students. And that is it for my happy positive updates for <laughs> students and staff here in Penfield Central. Um, I told you there's a slide here, Penfield Central School District updates, but I don't have any other updates than all the wonderful thing, things you've been hearing, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffel. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Putnam. Good evening, board. <clears throat> I don't have any pictures, but I have a lot of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to get some pictures in. You got, you got a graph meeting. in there. there a, yeah, visual. there's some visuals, yeah. yeah. Could you quick draw a few? Yeah, <laughs> hopefully you brought, like, some, like, um, eye lubricant in case your eyes go too dry. <laughs> That's what happens when you stare at Excel all day long. Uh, so two things to review. We have an updated local levy calculation. That's that tax cap formula I mentioned at the last meeting. Um, there would be a small change to the ERS exclusion, and now we have that information, so the board can actually approve that um, calculation tonight so we can submit it to the state. And then we'll review our first uh, draft of the 24-25 expenditure budget. And then we have on your um, agenda this evening is project change orders. I think there was two small um, ones and then one larger credit. Um, uh, we'll approve that tax levy limit calculation and we also need to approve um, a donation um, to the district. So here's where we are in the budget development process. Uh, tonight is the first full draft budget as we continue to look at revenue projections and appropriations analysis um, throughout this you know, next two months or so. Uh, here is that amended uh, local levy limit tax cap. The only difference is the line with that red arrow there. Um, it's that coming year exclusion. Um, so the reminder for this is that you're allowed to have an exclusion when the employer contribution rate on one of the pension systems increases by more than 200 basis points or two percentage points. So this current year, the ERS contribution rate was 13.1%. Next year, it's going up to 15.2%. So it's up 2.1%, so you can levy for that 0.1% difference. Um, that's a, a you know, part of the calculation that we can do. So it brings our total maximum allowable levy up to 4.56%, as opposed to last um, meeting when it was at 4.54%. Um, so at, before we get into the numbers, kind of just um, letting you know where we're at. So for new um, staffing for 24-25, these are positions that we've already had to incorporate this current year. Um, so positions that were unbudgeted, but we've had to add based on student requirements. Um, so we haven't filled it yet, but we have a new special education administrator. Uh, that's a 1.0 position. We've added three English language learning um, positions, teaching positions. We've talked about how that population has surged. Uh, we had to add a reading teacher, and then we're adding for next year's budget two K-5 social workers who were in the American Rescue Plan funds, the stimulus dollars. Those will be folded into the general fund for next year. As I'm sure you can guess, and we've heard a little bit tonight, we're also currently evaluating other proposals for next year, uh, different staffing needs that will be further fleshed out um, in the annual evaluations process that are going on with kids, um, kindergarten registration, things like that. So we'll have more grounded staffing information uh, in the next two or three meetings, but for now we have at least these new seven positions. Um, and there might be an opportunity to save a position or two here or there, but that's where we stand um, going into these numbers for context. So, uh, Real high level function here. Um, you can see the bottom line brings next year's budget to $119.1 million. So it would be a $2.2 .2 million increase or 1.92%. I want to clarify that the BOCES budget uh, are currently just my estimates. The BOCES budget process is going on right now. The initial request for service is due back at the end of the month. Um, so those numbers aren't completely settled. So this, this will change. It's just where we're at here in early February. We don't have insurance information yet, and when I say insurance, I don't mean like dental insurance or health insurance, but our actual like liability coverage, um, property coverage, those kind of things. Uh, we usually get that information March timeframe. We still have one, uh, one of our labor units has collective bargaining unsettled. Their contract is expiring in June, so we don't know exactly what the compensation for that group is gonna be yet, so there's some estimates there as well. And as I mentioned, staffing analysis is still underway. 
Uh, the general support budget, I'm going to get into all these functions in a little bit more detail in a moment, but general support is typically everything that's away from the classroom. So it's the HR office, it's the business office, it's the superintendent's office, it's the buildings and grounds, all of those things. Um, projected to increase next year a little over half a million dollars, or 4.69%. Uh, instruction increasing about $4 million next year, or a little over 6%. Uh, transportation budget, we'll, we'll look at in a little bit more detail after Mr. Gallo's presentation tonight, is projected to increase a little under half a million dollars. And then the undistributed costs, you know, which we'll look at, are going down significantly by that reduction in debt service um, that we talked about at our last meeting. So all up, all in, spending is only up, you know, less than 2%. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, the other way to slice it, that's function, is object. So looking at uh, wages, uh, projected increase about 5% next year. Contractual costs, essentially these are all services that are provided to Penfield by outside agencies. Um, so this includes like our utilities through RG&E, contracted nurses, contracted transportation, things like that. Uh, those BOCES costs that I mentioned that are kind of just an estimate, but it'll be somewhere in that range. Equipment and materials, um, significant increases in like the pricing of, you know, our facilities, trucks, things like that. Um, even, you know, material costs that are still going up, you know, as inflation tames a little bit, but just the cost of paper and toner and, and things like that, um, still significant increases. As I mentioned, that debt service drops off four and a half million dollars. Um, it's a huge drop off, but that, you know, coincides with the conversation we had last meeting around our building aid falling off a little bit. Employee benefits are scheduled to increase about 6%. Um, and interfund transfers up $30,000. Interfund transfers are the two transfers. One is made to the special aid fund to cover special education costs during the summer, and then the other one is to the cafeteria fund to cover any unpaid meal debt at the end of the school year. And again, you come to that $119.1 million number. So the first uh, you know, function that we'll look at in detail is the general support budget. So Board of Education costs are scheduled to be up just $2,500 next year. As an annual reminder to the community, I'm sure the board's well aware, but this is not salaries for board members. Um, you know, board members are, are volunteers and we're so grateful for all your service. Uh, but these are costs devoted to the annual meeting. It's costs devoted to policy services, training for the board, uh, the district clerk stipend, um, all of those kind of things. Superintendent's office um, is Tom's office. Uh, and, and Ms. Sastro, uh, the business office uh, encapsulates the 10 of us that oversee all the treasury for the, the district, um, payroll, accounts payable, purchasing, so on and so forth, uh, up 3.86%. Uh, Human resources is Dr. Kenny's office, um, scheduled to be up a little over 4.5%. Public information is everything related to Ms. Bradsheet's office, everything related to the postage and the mailings and all the things that um, we put out for community uh, information. Operations is everything related to the buildings uh, facility side of things. So it's all the custodians and cleaners and the, the water and the electric and natural gas and those kind of things. Um, not as big of an increase as it was last year, up about a quarter of a million dollars. Maintenance is related to all of our like um, upkeep of grounds, all the equipment repairs, all of the contractual repairs to the buildings, all the folks that work in um, you know the facilities department that aren't building based, so all the maintenance mechanics, groundskeepers, those kind of things, uh, <clears throat> up about four and a half percent on that. Central services relates to um, security, copy paper for the district, um, some shipping charges, postage, things like that. Insurance are what I mentioned earlier around the liability cost, uh, property protection. Miscellaneous is property tax refunds for any like uh, clerical errors with tax bills. Um, and then BOCES administration is the cost that we have to um, pay as one of the component districts to Monroe on BOCES. Uh, that's built by Arawada, which is the resident weighted average daily attendance because our enrollment is going up relative to the county. We see a little bit of an increase there. If your enrollment goes down, you might see a little bit of a decrease. So we're up 3.5%. Overall, on the general support side of the budget, we're up um, about 4.7% or a little over half a million dollars to $12.5 million. So instruction um, makes up almost $67 million of that $119 million budget. Uh, we start at the top with curriculum development. So this is the uh, offices of Dr. Potter and Dr. Maloney. Um, the curriculum directors are housed within there. 
This is where we have curriculum writing projects over the summer, um, all of those sorts of great things, up $83,000 for next year. School administration relates to all of the main offices of the six school buildings. So that is where our principals are housed, but also all the clerical folks that work in those offices. And then all of their professional development, paper, um, things like that. So that's up three and a quarter percent. Professional learning is the office headed up by Director Kevin Marriott. Um, so that is up $71,000 for next year as we make investments in professional learning and ensuring our staff are getting adequate training. General instruction is kind of just what we call classroom instruction. It's sort of just the um, uh, common branch education that you see, classroom education. Uh, that's scheduled to be up a little over 5% next year, $1.5 million. Uh, specialized education is every special program, so it's typically IEP driven. So any kiddo that has an individual education plan. Um, so this is our 12-1-1s, it's our 12-1-3-1s, it's speech, all of those kind of specialized components that um, make up the opportunities that we have here at Penfield. Up just about a million dollars for next year to 18.4. Occupational education is our uh, business education, it's our technology education, it also is all those vocational opportunities that we have uh, at Minor One BOCES. Um, for like new visions, automotive, catering, um, all those really exciting projects that we have available. The library is for our six libraries at all of our school buildings, scheduled to be up just about 3% for next year. Technology sees a large increase here, but this might change a little bit. So this is um, the year that we're scheduled to buy new printers and copiers. <laughs> um, typically we've purchased them, but we're also looking at like a, a lease plan instead of uh, purchasing. So this number would come down it would be a little bit more expensive overall, but we get a little bit more in terms of guarantees on uptime and service and things like that. And I don't know if you have issues with printers at home, but let me tell you, we have issues with printers uh, here at Penfield Central. Uh, we still go through a lot of paper. Um, so this might come down a little bit, but that's the reason for the big bump there. Um, we're in a really good steady state on staffing and technology. Our one-to-one -one program um, is you know, running the way it should. Uh, so no other big changes there other than that printer initiative. Uh, pupil services is everything related to nursing, counseling, social work, psychologists, uh, all those kind of things that we wrap around kids. Um, the big jumps there this year are for contracted nursing services. Um, so that's gotten very expensive. Um, so we've gone from about $100,000 in cost to this year we're going to be three, dollars $400,000 in cost probably for contracted nursing. Um, the other... Um, Item there is those additions of the two social workers coming over to the general fund for next year that are coming off of the, the federal stimulus dollars. And then our interscholastic, that's our sports and co-curricular is all of our clubs. Um, another significant investment there this year as we look to support all of our clubs and our director of athletics, Mary Beth Walker, looks to replace equipment. Um, there's also kind of a contingency here as we I guess there's a question of uh, girls ice hockey being added as a sport. So that would incorporate a new equipment cost, um, new jerseys, new supplies, all, all that kind of stuff. So overall, the instruction budget uh, is projecting to be up a little over 6% or just under $4 million annually. Transportation, as we heard about from Director Gala tonight, um, uh, personnel costs are a little bit of, of an estimate. That's the group that has their collective bargaining unknown for next year. Um, Equipment, um, large relative increase, but just $10,000 overall. Contractual costs, materials costs, kind of just um, some of those investments that Mike and his team are making. Um, the mechanics have brought forward some recommendations that make the buses last longer, so those are some of those things. Um, the bus garage itself, the budget is flat, so that's actually like the water, the natural gas for the garage, the supplies needed over there. And then the BOCES budget, as Mike mentioned, is um, the BOCES is kind of like us being able to hire some more drivers so they're able to do a little bit more for us which is great uh, it's better than the contracted transportation route um, that budget's projected to increase next year um, and they they do a good job they help us out they do a nice job so transportation overall scheduled to be up a little under half a million dollars so the undistributed uh, portion. So uh, registration, uh, so this is uh, it's technically a community service. That's why it falls under um, undistributed and not um, you know, instruction or general support. So this is our registrar, the folks uh, uh, who register all the kids and keep track of all of um, you know, the demographic information. Uh, just a $1,700 increase there. 
ERS, as we mentioned, seeing a big increase this year, going from that 13.1% to 15.2% increase. It's almost a 20% year-over-year difference. Uh, TRS, Teachers Retirement System, um, up you know, $300,000 for next year. The rate itself isn't up a lot in terms of contribution, but it's the earnings on the rates and the additional staffing is what makes, uh, makes that go up. Payroll taxes, so these are the costs that we have to pay on behalf of employees for Social Security and Medicare costs, uh, up about 4%. Uh, workers' compensation insurance, seeing a big jump this year, um, about 20%. As we've transitioned from the post-pandemic world and everybody's back working full-time, we had more injuries last year. <laughs> um, you know, during the pandemic, we just had a, a lot less of that kind of stuff going on. So the you know, premiums came down quite a bit. Um, but this is getting back more in line to where we were kind of five years ago on workers' comp. Other benefits include unemployment insurance, disability insurance, 403B contributions, and benefit administration. So if that is for the oversight of like the HSA cards, the FSA cards, things like that. The health and dental insurance is only up 4.74% um, budget-wise. Uh, if you recall back to our December meeting, the health plans are up about 7%, but the new Medicare savings, the new Medicare plan is bringing that down that number to about 4.7%. So that's an excellent number. Um, particularly because we're still seeing medical trend around 9, 10, 11% regionally and around the state. And then again, those two uh, debt payments drop way off uh, for next year. So debt principal is down $4.2 million and debt interest is down just about $400,000. And again, those inner fund transfers to the special aid fund and the cafeteria fund. So yep, undistributed goes down $2.7 million or 7% to uh, that $34.2 million number. So when we think about matching that $119 million to available revenue, um, we talked about uh, state aid last time, but if we were to go out at the cap, so that's that 4.56% uh, tax levy figure, that's what number would be available to us in that top row for property taxes in uh, STAR. Uh, pilots are relatively even year over year, just a $7,000 difference. State aid is down overall because of the drop in building aid, but we did see a, a generous bump in foundation aid. I want to point out that that state aid line might end up increasing come April 1st with the legislative budget. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about going back to what the foundation aid formula was supposed to be. For us, that would mean about a, another $300,000. So it'd be positive. Um, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, county sales tax, so as a reminder or, or new information, we're lucky enough to uh, be in a district where both Monroe County and Wayne County share um, sales taxes with the schools. Not every county in the state does that, but that is still growing at a robust rate, so we project that to be up about another 5.5% for next year. All other revenue um, is up about $184,000 for next year which leaves us to, well, I'll skip one line. So I want to point out that we're not using reserves again for next year. So there's no need to supplementally dip into reserves, um, those kind of one-shot revenues that we try to avoid. Uh, the assigned fund balance comes down to how much we need to assign to present a, a balanced budget to the voters in May. Um, you can see that we're at 118.599.6 there at a $119 million budget. So we do have a little bit of a shortfall even going out at the full tax cap. So as of tonight, February 13th, we're at that $119.1 million in costs. If we were at the full tax cap, the revenue available is at $118.6 million, presenting that $560,000 shortfall. That level of assigned fund balance has been in line with what we've done the last four years. We were around $400,000 this year, $250,000 the year before, $400,000 before that. For a long time, Penfield was just at $2 million of assigned fund balance. We, we didn't tinker with it too much. So if, for instance, we went down to a 3% levy increase as opposed to the 4.56, it would present available revenue of $117.5 million, so about a million dollars less, which would present a shortfall of $1.6 million, but still well within um, the auditors typically recommend you know, not using more than 2% of your operating budget as a signed fund balance. So we'd be well within that range. That'd be about $2.3 million for us for next year. So both of these scenarios would be acceptable. We're not making a recommendation tonight, just kind of letting the board know sort of where we're at. You know, These costs will change a little bit. Some of the revenue will change a little bit. But it is a year where we are going to have to have a levy. 
Uh, we're not going to be able to go out with a zero percent levy again. Um, and overall, this is this is a pretty good place to be. Some districts are talking about having to dip into reserves or you know do all these other things, make cuts. Some people aren't bringing the federal stimulus folks that they hired into the general fund budgets. They want to do layoffs instead. Um, so we're not in any you know bad shape like that. Um, and we're still evaluating conversations about what staffing is going to look like and programs and things like that. But generally, we're in a, a pretty good spot. So um, next steps, you know, we're going to get that levy calculation submitted to the Department of Tax and Finance and the Comptroller. Um, as you are aware, advocacy efforts are ongoing. It seems like there's a sustained push to get that foundation aid formula back to the way it was supposed to be. Um, we're hoping that maybe there'll be some more proposals around those OCCTE teachers and um, free, free meals. Uh, we'll have further refinement of these draft expenditures at our March meeting, particularly around staffing and those BOCES costs. And we'll also bring in our Director of Facilities, Mr. English, to review his department and his costs. And then in March, we also have to identify those budget propositions. You heard from Mr. Gale tonight that we will um, be looking to buy nine school buses this year. Instead of trading in school buses, the offers that we got on the trade-ins weren't great. We're going to try to auction them. So it's a little bit of a new thing for us this year. Um, and then the other fourth um, ballot, I, so we'll have budget vote, purchase of buses. We need to create a new capital reserve for bus purchases um, because the other one's been full. Um, and then the vote, the, the board election. So we'll have four ballot propositions come May. So that's a lot of me talking. <laughs> a lot of numbers. Very um, few pictures. <laughs> very few pictures. Not even any clip art or anything. Um, but I'd be very happy to field any questions or board members' questions or comments. Mark. Go ahead. Uh, um, okay. the, the nursing going up so much is that because of the nursing shortage and higher wages that we have to pay, or what is that? So this is for. We're fully staffed for nurses in district generally. Um, this is for outside services that our nurses can't do. So it's kids that have like one-to-one -one health needs, um, things like that. It's just it's grown a lot over the last couple of years. Um, one of my colleagues could probably elaborate further on the services that are needed, but they're they're in the school, they're on the buses with kids, um, and they're, it's every day. They're they're here a lot. Mm -hmm. Typically, we, we utilize <coughs> uh, organizations like WorkFit, which are we, we pay for those nurses to come in. And again, it, it is uh, primarily our students with uh, severe disabilities in regards to needing diaper changes and feeding. Um, you know, there are some students with, you know, feeding tubes and things like that that <coughs> we don't typically look to our, our educators to, to do those pieces and trying to work through. But those there's they're expensive um and so um, we're working through that now so we seem to be kind of at an inflection point in terms of i'd say not the budget necessarily but the whole financial aspect of things you know we've benefited from uh, covid programs to help get districts through covid the restoration of the um, uh, foundation aid formula all those things and now we're kind of like I think all that is behind us mm -hmm. is that pretty safe to say yeah. yeah and and we're fortunate we have this debt uh, drop off of the debt principle which helps keep this all working out but <coughs> how do you see this going forward because that that the reduction debt principle is not an ongoing type thing so how do you see this going forward as far as managing now that the now that we're back into that steady state mm -hmm. tighter money yeah. situation so it in terms of managing the debt service versus the building aid, it's conversation. Just, the, you know, just maintaining, you know, year over year budget increases mm -hmm. because we because now we're back into the normal funding, shall we say, normal funding increases. Yeah. So, I hesitate to like put forward like a five year plan to say, oh, I think <coughs> we're going to be at two and a half percent for the next five years. I think we've learned so much in the last. Um, three years that things are volatile and they're we're subject to political headwinds and we have actual student needs that we need to monitor um, all the while trying to be fiscally responsible to the community at a level that is acceptable um, you know we run through projections three five years um, next year we should have more building aid coming back as you know our current project wraps up um, we are in a point where I think we're in a steady state on expenditures you know we're not 
adding the dozens of staff like we did in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we're adding at least a half dozen next year, but it's not as significant. Last year, spending was up 7%. This year, you know, we're at 2%. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. I hesitate to speculate. Um, I have my own internal assumptions. Um, but yeah, it should be less volatile than it's been in the last couple of years. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. That concludes superintendent reports. So I, Kristen is gonna finish. Okay. I have to go pick up my daughter. No problem. For the viewing public, uh, life happens even to board members. So um, Dr. Roberts is going to step away and Ms. Harley will take over as the chair of this meeting. Huh? All right, guys. All right, so that brings us to public comment, which we do not have this evening. So we're going to move to item 6A, which is our change orders. <coughs> May I please have a motion and a second that the change orders as described below be approved. So moved. Second. Board members, any questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? All in favor, none opposed. <coughs> that brings us to item 7A, adoption of our tax levy, tax levy limit. Resolve that the Board of Education of the Penfield Central School District hereby approves the submission of the tax levy limit of $71,426,358 as calculated in accordance with guidance sent forth by the State Comptroller, Comptroller excuse me, the Commission of Education and the Commission of Taxation and Finance. This tax levy limit represents an increase of 4.56%. May I have a motion and a second? I'm second. Board members, any questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? All in favor, none opposed. And that brings us to item 7B. May I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approve an amendment totaling $1,000 to the 23-24 budget as shown above. The amount submitted both as revenue and expenditure items and express its gratitude to the donors for their generous support of Penfield Schools. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Board members, any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? All in favor, not opposed. Okay, that brings us to item 8A, textbook approval. Board members, may I please have a motion and second that the board approves the recommended textbook as presented to the board on January 23rd, 2024. So moved. Second. Board members, any questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? All in favor, not opposed. And that brings us to item 9A, which is our school calendar approval. May I please have a motion and a second that the board approves the 24-25 school calendar as presented. So moved. Second. Board members, any questions or comments? Yeah, I'd like to amend the motion. Is there a second? Well, I'm sorry, what's the amendment? Second. Oh, so now I say what the amendment is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like I said, this is going to be. No, but we have a second. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. yep. And okay. so then you would share, and this is just for the viewing public, the wonderful worlds of Robert's Rules of Order. Okay. So then uh, um, you've so got the second, and then I think um, you, have to, to, you have to mention what the, the um, what the amendment is to the calendar. Okay. So I would like to take off, um, uh, so right now, October 14th is, um, Columbus Day slash Indigenous Peoples Day, and I'd like to take off Columbus Day and just have it be Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, the reason is, you know, uh, do we vote on that? Oh, yeah. So, <coughs> um, and first. you can talk through okay. the reason, and okay. then the, um, and then there would be a, a vote on the amendment, okay. and if there was a majority vote of the board agreeing with the amendment, 
then the vote is taken on the amended motion. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, sometime last year, there was a student group that came and, and sort of made an appeal to us that we change, change that day, um, and I agree with their reasons. I, you know, for a lot of indigenous people groups, Columbus Day is a day of mourning, um, and it, it's, it's celebrating two contradictory Mm -hmm. uh, entities or ideas um, because Columbus coming to the Bahamas actually <laughs> sparked basically catalyzed began the end was the beginning of an end to a civilization and so by by sort of both anzing I feel like it is disrespectful to, I, I feel like it's a, a whitewashing of history. And um, I, think, I think we always have to be willing to ask ourselves if somebody we've been honoring is honorable. Um, and we always have to be willing to reevaluate. Is this person we're honoring honorable? And, and most, scholars or historians have, by looking at primary documents, have s seen a lot of dishonorable things about C Christopher Columbus. So um, I, I think it's been intertwined with, um, with celebrating Italian American heritage and, and I think it's great to uh, celebrate Italian American heritage, uh, but I think they have to be disengaged from each other, that they're not the same things. So we could celebrate the contributions of Italian Americans without honoring what is widely considered a dishonorable man. So the amendment is the calendar as is, except the name of the holiday for the calendar purpose would just read indigenous people not slash columbus day right. and and um so that's that's the amendment then that um the board has to vote on um making that amendment and then vote again if if that passes on the calendar itself does that make sense i think so okay. so we take a vote on the amendment oh sorry go ahead Columbus Day is still a state holiday. Are we required to recognize state holidays? We are required to recognize state holidays by the day off of school. Students cannot attend on that day. Uh, it is considered a state holiday and recognized by the federal government as well. Um, and just like the state and the federal government, they read a proclamation on both of those days on the same day. Um, <clears throat> but the calendar itself, so, so the reality is with the calendar is it becomes, <coughs> this is my two cents, I work for the board, um, is that it really is a symbolic gesture because changing what we put on the calendar that goes on the website doesn't change our curriculum. We still will teach Columbus. It starts in fifth grade with the, they actually do a great lesson around age of exploration or um, exploitation. And, and so that teaching ha happens, um, but it just is the name that's on the calendar. So the, the short answer is yes, the dis we would not be the first district to remove Columbus Day from that holiday. And uh, we're, not, we're under no obligation no, to keep it on there. So correct. Really what I was we can't at. say we're going to have school that day. That's, that's the piece. The, the, what, the, what the district puts on their calendar is, is the ability. And I, I, I know there are a number of districts in the state and um, several in Monroe County who have already made this change, um, that their boards did exactly sort of what you're doing now and having the conversation and making a making decision. This is a really long answer for a pretty easy question. I apologize, Mark. Um, okay, and do you know how it came about that Indigenous People Day got coupled with Columbus Day in the first place, because I'm not clear about that. 
It, it was what? President. Yes. So it was the it was federally started first, and really as a my understanding, and I do not have all the history, so yeah, this is just I me think. talking. <coughs> okay. um, but ultimately, Columbus is seen as as a former history teacher. Again, Columbus is seen as somebody whose actions by arriving um, ended up hurting indigenous people uh, mm -hmm. and their culture, destroying. And so that sort of it was a. It was an add-on kind of like, mm -hmm. and there are states that don't um, celebrate uh, officially observe Columbus Day. Mm -hmm. There are states that have just Indigenous Peoples Day, and there okay. are states that have different, um, even different names for that for that holiday. So, putting Indigenous People Day, uh, uh, connecting it with Columbus Day, is acknowledging the harm done to the Indigenous people. Yeah. To your point. That's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think you could have. Yeah, I don't think you could honor. This, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you can honor a person who destroyed the other person on the calendar, or began to. Yeah, I know what you're saying. One of the things I, I'll point. So, before this, I was a history teacher and enjoyed that very much, and so. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting things with Columbus Day is, is it was originally, it's been around for a long time, and it was re originally for uh, acknowledging anti-Italian sentiment that was in, our, was in our nation. And just about every group um, had at some point people not liking them, right? So that's why it originally came in back in late 1800s. Um, and so instead of, instead of calling it Italian American Day, they used Columbus as because he was known as a as a hero at the, at that time um, within especially within the Italian American um, heritage. <clears throat> and I I do like I don't get a vote, but I appreciate um, Nicole in the sense of separating that. So it's not it's you're not saying we don't want to celebrate Italian Americans. That's still there, but the name Columbus on on it is where the concern is. Well. Um, Except the Italian American aspect of it is bumped off when it becomes Indigenous People Day. I think the one piece for me is, and I and it's really as I look back, and for me is is it's a symbolic gesture and one that's a, a good uh, intellectual debate around like. We still celebrate Italian American Month. We still celebrate Italian Americans throughout history in our curriculum. This doesn't change. I want to be fair. It's like this doesn't necessarily change our any of the teaching we have mm -hmm. around a, a, to Italian Americans or around Columbus mm -hmm. or around other explorers that he is put into the same category of our explorers unit that our students learn throughout their time in, in Penfield. Um, but I, but I think in terms of acknowledging, it's not taking away, it's just that name, I guess. And so. I think it's also important to acknowledge the request of students. So it was, even though it was before my, my time here as a board member, um, it's my understanding that students came last year and asked that this be something that could be removed off the calendar. Yep. And I, I will add too for remember is they uh, that is our mosaics group at the high school and they came uh, and spoke at the board twice, mm -hmm. uh, once in a time we never talk about when we were in the auditorium during COVID. We like to pretend we never had meetings in there and <laughs> never took place. But they did speak then, um, and they had some other uh, um, pieces that they talked about and they referenced this request and then they came back and presented here last year. <laughs> um, after the calendar had been approved and such. Um, and we talked about it going into this year, and ultimately the current calendar we have, we, we, we left as is. Um, but this is something that's come up from our student groups. I went and met with the Mosaics group after they presented, and we talked through it. Um, they are a wonderful group um, uh, of kids advocating and really spoke to much of what Nicole said in terms of how do we, as students, see these two groups trying to be honored on one day. And where I continue to go is other districts have made this change. When I say it's symbolic, it means we're not, I'm not saying, oh, we're not going to ever teach this again, or we're not going to talk about it, we're not going to honor um, other groups. Um, it really is highlighting the Indigenous Peoples Day, which falls on the same 
piece. So it, really the big change, if we have to look at it, because I, I know any of these changes are difficult, and I think there'll be people in anywhere. It's an argument all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, turn on any social media. There, it's, it's an argument around this. It's a conversation happening nationally. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, what's really important, too, is it, the biggest change, if this amendment goes through and the calendar is voted on, the only real change is what's on the calendar mm -hmm. and what goes on the website. In the, how the calendar looks when it has that day as a holiday, when you look over to the right, it would say Indigenous Peoples Day, not slash Columbus Day. So, you know, that's the, uh, when I look at it sort of symbolic, it's a, it's a gesture. It doesn't, it doesn't change necessarily, but it also is, I hear you, is listening to the students who put a lot of work into that, thought through it, did the research, and then sort of looking at our neighboring schools and what others are looking at. So it's one that I, as I say, I work for the board and I'll fully support, you know, where this, where this lands with the amendment. Which, which month is Italian, sorry, Kath. No, which month October. is it, it's Italian? It's October. October? Yep. I saw that Helen had her hand up if you want to go there and yeah. then I've got a comment. I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk. You <laughs> are, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you don't get to vote, but you get to talk. <laughs> okay, so I was just wondering, Dr. Putnam, you said that the only thing that we had to do for the state was just not have school that day. Right. So I'm wondering, is there anything that would stop us from being like Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, how about Board of Education Members Day. Like, is there any restrictions on that whatsoever? Like, you know yeah. what? I'm pretty good answering board members' questions, but you have stumped me on that, <laughs> so I don't know. Okay. I would assume, which, you know, gets everybody in trouble, that the reality is what you put on your school calendar probably doesn't matter in the in regards to the state it's the fact that underneath new york state education law that day we can't have kids come to school okay. you'll see next year the th this year it happened but for the next year's calendar january 29th is the lunar new year which was just celebrated this past saturday mm -hmm. And I have wonderful relatives who send all my kids every time this great stuff um, about Lunar New Year. So my kids enjoy it because they get money out of it, but it's also <laughs> really a neat little gift. Um, but I share that as that is now in New York State also a required student holiday. <clears throat> and so that date changes every year. So next year it falls in, on a Wednesday. We can't have school. Um, and then the year after that, it happens to fall during what will probably be February break. Um, so we, you, the board probably could change it to other things. Um, that's interesting. Well, one school district took off all holiday names and just have all the holidays as day off. So even Christmas is day off. Interesting. <laughs> I'm not advocating no, for no, that. I'm I, just saying yes. that it sort of goes to I what think that's, was. Be, like I'd want to <laughs> double check that, but ultimately it's it's what it's called is, is different. And so I can speak, I don't want to speak about other districts and use their name, right? But there are two that I know of and I've talked to their superintendents over the last couple of years who did this. The board made an amendment during a meeting, it was voted on and they, they, they dropped the Columbus from the calendar. Um, you know, it's still, it, it's still in New York State Columbus Day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'll still be, you know, those pieces. As I look at what those, what those impacts are, I go back to, that's the pieces we're not saying, or I don't think the board is saying, we're not going to talk about this person. It's still, he, he's still a, a part of history, and, and we, uh, we teach that through our curriculum, depending on what grade level and where it falls with explorers and the age of exploration and, and, um, and, and, and such, so. Catherine? Right, um, regarding the students coming and talking to us about that, um, I always love it when the students come and advocate, but I also like to take um, just a reminder that when students do come and advocate, that doesn't mean they, <laughs> I mean, Mark and I know <laughs> from working on legislative, you can ask, you can advocate, you can work, you can, push, you can prod, and in adult life, very often, it, it's an uphill climb, and it's over and over and over again. So when we have issues that the students bring to us, um, I, let me say this the way I really mean it. Um, 
I feel like it's always valid and it's always important to listen to our students and to honor our students. But I don't feel compelled just because our students asked us to do something to necessarily do it. I feel <coughs> that the discussion has to be had, that thought has to be put into it. Feasibility, um, outcomes, all sorts of things go into making these decisions. So as much as I always want to encourage the students to come and advocate for what's important to them, I think it always has to be understood that it's bigger than, and this is something that's important to me. It fits into a bigger picture. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, no, that's why I said in the beginning, they said it and I agree. Yes, and, and Aaliyah and, and, said yeah. something about honoring students' requests. Yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, it's balancing it all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Board members, anything else? Like, I, I just want to reiterate, you know, I think any time in history, you know, if something, God forbid, was discovered really heinous about Martin Luther King, and it was decided, you know, we just can't have that on the calendar anymore, MLK Day. And maybe it would get changed to Civil Rights Day because we still have to, well, then sadly so be it. Um, so I hope that never happens. I hope nothing heinous is ever discovered. But I, I, I think we all have to hold our heroes loosely um, in that regard. Um, and just as all over the nation do, you know, the question is answered, questions being asked, do we want to lionize um, some of these Confederate generals and have them in the public square? I think, I think we're better, as a nation, we're better off for it by asking those questions mm -hmm. um, and reevaluating who gets to be a hero. Yeah. So, and remembering our heroes were human, living in their eras, their time, their mindsets, acceptable behavior, how people evolve and move on. So that's why, like you said, evolving and moving on would be acknowledging that there's a group of people that were hurt and oppressed and that day is a day of mourning for them. And our students have advocated and said we need to take this off our calendar and we need to evolve as a school district. Yeah, that's why mm. we're discussing it yeah. and voting. Board members, anything else? Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, <laughs> then we will take a vote on the amended motion made by Nicole to remove the word Columb words Columbus Day from October 14th. Is that you correct? Am I saying that correctly? Dan, can you repeat oh. what you said? I think you need a second for the amended motion. Okay. Yeah. I already did. Uh, oh, did yeah, yeah, Aaliyah yes. did yes. second that. Yeah. Yes. Who was the second? Aaliyah was. Okay. Yeah. Nicole made the motion. Aaliyah seconded it. Then we opened yeah. up for discussion. Okay. Are we ready to vote on the amended motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor of the amended motion, please raise your hand. We have five in favor. And, and all those opposed? And we have one not voting. You, do the you motion, abstain? Are you abstaining? abstaining. Okay. okay. So motion passes. Five. Five. Yes votes. Yeah. Then yes. Yeah. I'm doing the math yes. in my head. That it's would be majority. Be, it's got to be majority, majority. Even if the majority of the board, even yes. if not all the board is here. Yeah. Yes. So that's the amendment. And then you would take a vote on the, ca on the motion, motion, which would be the calendar with the amendment. Okay. So glad Emily left tonight. <laughs> You're doing a fine job. <laughs> All right, board members, may I please have a motion and a second that the board approves the 24-25 school calendar with the new amended date of October 14th, reading just Indigenous people. So moved. Second. second. Oh, sorry. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? All in favor? None opposed. Motion passes. Never met that Ooh. Roberts of <laughs> the rules Robert? of order, but <laughs> it's a little very confusing. organized. It's very organized, but a little confusing. It's a good learning experience yeah. for mm -hmm. everybody. All right. All right. That brings us to item 10 on our agenda, policy review. 
and just a, we have no feet no, no um feedback. input or no no feedback from the community around this workplace violence prevention is a required policy yep. we had to put in place in the student voter registration with just some language changes uh, that comes from um, our policy services so minor changes there the workplace violence is a new policy okay Board members, may I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves the following pre policies as presented. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Questions or comments? I should have done questions first. Sorry. All right, that moves us to item 11, President's remarks and presentations. First being the Legislative Committee. Nicole. Oh, sorry. Did you go to um, that meeting? Yeah, well, all I wanted to say about that is what is we talked about the questions that were going to be asked at the legislative breakfast, okay. which I did not attend, but some of you did. <laughs> so. They were great questions. <laughs> so it was a really boring lunch because all we talked about was questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Well, that bring us to, brings us to legislative breakfast, then, which I think just brings Mark because I know I had a pull out last minute because of an ill family member. So, um, um, we did have a legislative breakfast. We had this every year. It was very well attended, as as it is. And, uh, and one of the big uh, changes this year was we had students come up and do presentations mm -hmm. uh, before, you know, on different positions, bef uh, oh, and they they spoke so well. Yeah. They did. Uh, right. yeah. There was one woman who was with Greece, and she used to be one of our urban suburban students. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I. Mm -hmm. I thought she was so extremely well spoken, which means because she came from our. Yep. She was, <laughs> <in Canada. laughs> but but they all were well spoken. They all did very well, and I know at least one of them had like a day's notice, so yeah. they they did well, and and uh, so with that, I was the table leader for our assembly representative Jen Lunsford, where I had the questions. Unfortunately, I had to turn in the questions which had the notes on them. Mm. So I don't have them. I was hoping to get the, they were going to transcribe the notes. I was hoping to have those to present. So when I do get them, maybe at the future meeting, we'll go over the notes okay. uh, with a little more detail. But I know uh, a lot of very topical things were, and I can just say that on all of the things, uh, Jen uh, exhibited just a very, very detailed knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, very broad and very deep. And I, I was really impressed with how much she knew, not just about the topics, but the workings of of the state, which is a whole topic in itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she talked about how things come to pass, you know, and there's always, you know, the collaboration between the governor and the legisla legislature always has rooms for improvement. Um, now, the one thing I will talk about specifically, bec which, because it was everybody's topic, is electric buses. You know, there, there was a lot of discussion about that. Actually, one of the students spoke about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's the issues that we've talked about you know the cost, the availability, the, the infrastructure, and the time frame, and you know, you know basically, this is acknowledged statewide, statewide from all the districts, statewide from uh, the utilities are really feeling the heat because of this now, and statewide to the legislature. So you know the story's not over with. I think the important thing to to take away from this is the state and the legislature and the governor come out with things that have good intentions. They don't necessarily get the implementation right, mm -hmm. but it's not locked in stone. So when things come out like this that are really great ideas, and but we say, hey, there's a lot of problems with this, we do what we do, we advocate, and we tell them, we share the information. And you know, it takes time, but they listen, and they, as, and again, it's not just us, it's everybody, they listen, and they make changes. So. Just because we see a lot of problems with electric buses doesn't mean we should abandon it. Doesn't mean we should ask the state to abandon it. We make that we work with them to essentially modify the expectations mm -hmm. to things that are that that can be successful for everybody. And she recognizes that, um, and that's what she pretty much conveyed. So, anytime any of this stuff, you know, Common Core or all these APPR, all this stuff, you know, it's not locked in stone. We, it, it, it evolves because it starts with a good intention and it's just too complex for the legislature and the governor to get right the first time. That's fair. But that's, that's it. If we get, when I get the notes and I, I'll share them at a future meeting. And, Thank you. And Thank I, you I, for going. Hmm? Oh, uh, I was really bummed. Uh, I, 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 thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, labor relations is coming up tomorrow, but I will say since you 
someone brought it up here. Oh, because it was our policy. The um, the topic is workplace violence, yeah. and it's yeah. already I've been told it's going to be very well attended, both in person and on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, labor relations has a great has <coughs> great presentation. and we will, and you know, we'll talk about it at the next meeting. Can I ask you a quick question? <laughs> was there a lot of discussion around free lunches? There was actually yeah. yes, there was. That was one of the topics. I don't think that was a specific question, but we did. Uh, the, the conversation Edna flowed into, into <coughs> tangential areas, so yes. Um, Would you say, at I was at, the table I was at was pretty clear that that's where I think the legislators um, support that yeah. idea? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so at least the positivity of they, they br have been bringing that conversation to Albany and trying to push. Um, I, I'm not hopeful it's going to happen for next year, but at least the conversation still continuing to to take place. But right. it's a fiscal issue. It's a fiscal yep. issue at the state, and then at the federal government for for their mm -hmm. financial assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know the thing is, right now I think these are based on the overall. And, and I know the, the, Tom and <coughs> Dan can explain it better, but it's based upon you know the the level of people in the just mm -hmm. like for the free to reduce lunches yep. right. and you know that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a need or not a need for this because there are families who may have be uh, well of means but in other ways may be dysfunctional and the child suffers mm -hmm. uh, as well and you know then so it's not just income it's yeah. just the ability of the family for, to provide meals for the kids mm -hmm. and we want the kids to be in the best state of mind that's why we have we talk about you know um, you know mental health mm -hmm. there's the physical health the physical presence and that's where that money will make a big difference in having the child be able to be in the place where they can be successful in learning mm -hmm. yeah because if they're hungry they're not learning yeah, yeah. They we, talk we've talked a number of times but it's just so important I don't have the number uh, you know memorized but the 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 family household income that you need to have in order to um, in order to get free and reduced lunches right mm -hmm. is not set by us and it's low yes. like so there are if you if you know there are plenty of families who um, you know because they have because of the number of the kids they have because of the the co cost that they have for home insurance everything else goes up so even though they might be above that minimum <laughs> threshold to apply for free or reduced lunch that's it's so low like right. I mean it, it needs to that's one of those pieces that you know if the state could in, look at in those we talked about at our table um, at, at legislative breakfast even if it was a, a redoing and, and looking at that and the state coming in saying you know maybe it's not free lunches for all but we're gonna we're gonna somehow find a way to increase that so so it becomes um, that household income that you get is so low to in order to qualify it doesn't it doesn't really make sense so we have a lot of, of folks who i think probably don't apply but could really be beneficial to it we and i i was over already. at cobbles today and you're you know you're talking about it's one thing maybe when we talk about high school kids who maybe could go and make themselves a lunch but when we talk about like kindergarten first grade and, and you look at that and the kids are coming to school hungry mm -hmm. and then have to make it through the day um it, it, it's yeah. it's a lot and Thanks. we saw it we saw it work during covid i mean during yeah. covid there were waivers and everybody you know like that the state allowed the, the free lunches and um it, it was really we we saw how it could work mm -hmm. um, and but, we said that one of the things that our table talked about that question was um how if everyone has it it can eliminate like maybe what you saw that there's some kids that families that don't utilize it because of maybe of embarrassment yep. and so if every mm -hmm. if it was offered to everyone it can take away a, you know stigma, stigma that some kids may feel yeah you know i'll tell you and it was i i, I can't remember everything sort of blends into like last year but i think it was like <laughs> 10 I, I was the high school principal at the time <clears throat> when i started in penfield in 2008 you had to you only put in your id number if you got free and reduced lunch mm -hmm. and then our cafeteria system changed and every you put in your id even if you're paying cash you put in your i your id mm -hmm. um and and we saw our free and reduced numbers go up i can't say that's exactly why but it really was it took the stigma away because <coughs> everybody had to punch in yeah. their code not just kids who were getting the free lunch mm -hmm. and so i think it says a lot that that 
I do agree there are individuals across who don't apply because of the feelings with it, so, mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate. Yeah. And I also think, because where I work, we our kids qualify because we're below that level. Like, I have a child who was buying milk, and the parents wrote a letter and said, just please get her lunch so that we're not having to pay for it and throw it out. And I was like, what a waste of, like, yeah. just the plates that they're on, the food that it's on, like, I don't understand why, as a state, if someone wants just milk, we can't just give them free milk. That drive, like, that just put me over the edge. Like, I got it. Like, why yeah. would you pay for it if you didn't have to? But they're just trashing mm -hmm. that food. Yep. The way I they think do that's their crazy, moves. and like it's just so much waste yeah. mm -hmm. when there are people that are really hungry. Yeah, it's not good for our environment. It's not good for kids. Like, yeah, yeah we definitely need to figure so something out. Word from there. is, I think everybody there um, at the breakfast uh, who works um, in government is supportive of that. But mm -hmm. in terms of will it, will it get legs um, to to pass through Albany? I I don't know, but they were very supportive. It was a nice. Was. Good experience. <clears throat> and that brings us to information exchange. Okay. Well, I, I attended the meeting, well, via Zoom. Um, and we had Steve Pellets, um, and he runs the environmental services with the county at the, um, and it was all about the eco park. <coughs> and so there was a lot of information, but just a few little sound bites here um ours is the first in the county in the state a one-stop drop for hard to recycle items and they went through like a lot of these recycled items that you just wouldn't believe i mean you don't even think um uh let's see for schools well overall pfafs paint, lab chem chemicals, hand sanitizer, vaping devices, cleaning products, mercury, fluorescent bulbs. Um, uh, there is a contractor for the county that handles some of that, and then Eco Park handles others. Some of the things that are problems that you don't think of, uh, a big problem is the vape de vaping devices have to be recycled and now they're they're being imported from China, looking like highlighters, which mm -hmm. was new to me. So you don't even know that some I know and it's all sorts of stuff. Um, let's see, lithium batteries. <laughs> they were partnered with Lifecycle, but you know what's happening with Lifecycle now? Uh, that that whole complex was being built, and now it's it's been stopped. I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, but there was but there was something else I wanted to make mention of. Oh, the hand sanitizer. They showed this huge, this picture of all these pallets of hand sanitizer that were that was bought during the pandemic, that is now just sitting there waiting to be recycled. It, it's expired, probably. Right? Well, we were told in this talk that it actually doesn't really expire. Oh. But it's not needed. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it, it was an overpurchase during COVID. Um, if you remember, it was the, um, the, the New York State um, pushed through and we got a lot of, we have like these gallon jugs yes. of the hand sanitizer. And not that I'm going to name drop, but it doesn't smell like Purell. Like it's, it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, which was like, you know, it was, hey, it was COVID and people ran and, but it is some, it's not. I mean, Purell, I'll keep all day long. I know, you know I know. It just scent, was, it's just an amazing thing. <laughs> what lovely. is, what is, yeah. you know, taking up space in our landfills. But yeah. um, Don Howe is, um, she was another speaker. She's with Genesee Valley uh, BOCES, the Health Safety Risk Management Office. And she services Penfield yep. for, for yeah. yeah. Okay. So she showed, she told us what she does um let's see the dangerous chemicals the outdated unused chemicals paint mercury not that we have mercury or or um you know um what she was saying was she has worked with a lot of the school districts and a lot of this they've cleaned up a lot of stuff mm -hmm. 
so um, she wasn't speaking to all of us individually like, you know, um, you've got you've got work to do, but she was a little exasperated at how resistant certain districts can be because it's a simple process. She was saying that all, all anybody has to do is just call her or call them and, you know, we'll be there in a few weeks. It'll take a few weeks because it's just them and with districts, school districts, it's not the same as individual households, so there's different rules, so they can't just come and do it that day. But, you know, you're put on the calendar and it's handled. And that's all you have to do. So um, she wanted all of us to know that because um, when you, she was saying too that a lot of the, like the shop teachers and art, the art teachers where they have to get the paint and the glue and all sorts of different things that you don't think about disposing of. And then at the end of the school year, they can't part with them. Like, what if I need it? Or, you know, they, we know all about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's how everybody lives, right? Mm -hmm. So she was explaining all that and, you know, how you can store things that you have to keep. It was very informative. It was, um, it was a recorded, I'm freezing, so I'm shivering here. Um, it was a recorded meeting, so you can find it on the uh, Monroe County School Board website. It was a good meeting. Okay. That brings <sighs> us to 11B, which is our BOCES board candidates. The following BOCES board members' terms end as of June 30th, 2024. Tom Nespeka, a resident of the Webster Central School District. Margaret Burns, a, res a resident of the West Arondequoit Central School District. Mark Kokanovich, a resident of the Brighton Central School District, Maureen Nupp, a resident of the Fairport Central School District, and Nancy Small, a resident of the East Arondequoit Central School District. BOCES board members are elected by their component member boards. This year, the BOCES administrative budget vote is being held on April 23rd, 2024. And our, uh, the Board of Education will be holding a workshop at 5 p.m on Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, in the Penfield High School Library. Is there any unfinished business or new business? All right, may I please have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 8.36 p.m. So moved. Second. So, board members, questions or comments? All those in favor? All those in favor, not opposed. Very <laughs> <laughs> good job. Right. First time is always.